everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the event producer. Hello. Thanks for tuning in. It's Sea Otter Awareness Week, and tonight we're dedicating Night School to our fluffy furred friends. Before we get into our lineup, we want to give a special thanks and shout, shout out to Sea Otter Savvy for teaming up with us to put this event together. They've been hosting events all week long in celebration of sea otters, so please feel free to follow them to see what else they have in store for the week. And tonight we're very excited because we're doing a night school first, which is one of our guests is streaming uh, tonight from inside the academy, um, somewhere actually deep inside the academy that most of you probably haven't been before, um, our scientific collections. And so our collections manager, Mo Flannery, is all set up um, back at the academy, and she's going to give you a mini tour of the sea otter related part of the mammalogy collections. Um, she'll be up first, and then she's coming back at the end, so don't go anywhere. And then Lillian Carswell and Andy Johnson are here to cover both the history and the future of the sea otter in, in Northern California. And yes, this includes the bay um, and what it might mean to restore the species to its historic range. And as always, this program is live. So please say hi and share any comments or questions in the chat. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end of the night with everyone. So make sure to get your questions in. And now we'll turn it over to Mo at the Academy. everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Ornithology and Mammalogy Collection. Although the Academy is still closed, I'm really lucky to be here tonight with some of our sea otter specimens. So the Ornithology and Mammalogy Collection is down in the first basement of the museum. Behind the main floor of the museum, we actually have more than 46 million specimens in the entire Academy collection. Now the, that's made up of all sorts of different taxa like plants, herpetology specimens, fish specimens, geology specimens, invertebrate zoology specimens, entomology specimens, anthropology specimens, and if I forgot any of the other collections, I'm sorry, um, but they make up the entire academy collection, microbiology specimens too. But the ornithology and mammalogy collection here, we have 100,000 birds, 30,000 mammals, and 11,000 eggs and nests. And they're all stored in this room, which you can't see the whole room, but it's a very large room where we store those specimens. And the specimens in birds and mammals range in size from things like the blue whale skeleton that you might have seen on the main floor of the museum, that's 87 feet long, and teeny tiny hummingbird eggs that are down the hall from me now. But tonight we're gonna to talk about sea otters, and we actually have the world's largest collection of southern sea otter specimens in the US. And that is over 1,500 catalog specimens in the collection. Now that actually is two times the number of all the other sea otter, southern sea otter specimens in museums in the US. So we have 68% of the southern sea otter specimens here. And the reason we have that is we have been a repository for sea otters that wash up dead along the coast here in California. After they get examined at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they get a necropsy done to try and find out why they died. The skulls, or sometimes the entire skeleton, like this one behind me, um, is an articulated skeleton, come here to the museum. So we have sea otter skeletons, we have sea otter pelts, we have sea otter skulls, we have sea otter baculum or penis bones, um, at pretty much anything you can think of with sea otters, probably stomach contents as well. And I am going to come back at the end and take you down to the inside of our sea otter collection. But for now, we're gonna learn more about the ecology, the history and the future of sea otters from Andy and Lillian. And you can ask questions later. We'll see you when you come back to the collection. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you tonight. Um, the title of my portion of this night's nice panel is a bit of a mouthful. It's the unfinished story of the Southern Sea Otter's return to ecological relevance. It's a long title because it's a long story. 
So uh, tonight I'll be giving you a whirlwind overview of sea otter history, a quick look at the current status, and a look into some of the exciting new work that's happening in sea otter ecology and economics. Sorry about that, I had a little um, connection issue, but uh, I think I'm on track now. So starting way back in time, the ancestor of sea otters diverged from Eurasian sea otters about 5 million years ago. And by the mid 1700s, the range looked something like this. It spanned the entire North Pacific Rim from Japan to all the way halfway down Baja, California. The maritime fur trade began in 1742 with uh, Russians bringing back the first sea otter pelts from Bering Island and discovering that it was immensely lucrative to sell them to China, where they were considered to be a status symbol. This is Gregory Shelikov, who was a Russian merchant. He um, launched several fur expeditions and founded the first outposts on the north American coast, the first Russian outposts on the North American coast. So the Russians coerced, enslaved, um, forced the uh, native Alaskans into actually doing the hunting for them, a practice that was followed by people of other nations. But indigenous people also traded furs for European goods. Now, others in the world were quick to realize how much money could be made from this. And so soon there was an international fur rush going on with British, American, and Spanish and Japanese merchants all trying to get their share of um, this black gold. So the result of that was that a range that was of sea otters that numbered from an estimated 150,000 to 300,000 was reduced to just 2,000 animals worldwide scattered in these 13 remnant populations. And the one that was furthest away from any of them is that one on the right of your screen there at Big Sur. And those few dozen sea otters that survived off of Big Sur are the progenitors of all southern sea otters, one of the three recognized subspecies. So sea otters were taken all throughout California, throughout Baja, California. Uh, there were massive numbers around the Channel Islands, but there were also massive numbers in San Francisco Bay. Accounts of the trade uh, describe up to 2,000 sea otters per year being taken in the early 1800s, which was the peak of the sea otter um, fur trade in California. I'm going to read you an account from a Frenchman who wrote a history or an account of San Francisco in 1816. Uh, he said, sea otters abound in the harbor and in the neighboring waters, and their fur is too valuable for them to be overlooked by the Spaniards. An otter skin of good size and of the best quality is worth $35 in China. M. Kuskoff, assisted by the small number of men with him, catches almost 2,000 otters every year without trouble. The otter skins are usually sold to American traders. By 1911, when the International Fur Seal Treaty put an end to the fur trade, um, as well as the scarcity of otters also put an end to it, most Californians had never heard of a sea otter. And if they had heard of a sea otter, they believed that they were extinct in the contiguous US. But in fact, there was that small colony at, uh, that small remnant population at Big Sur, and a few people knew about it. Uh, the state listed, the Southern sea otter as a fully protected mammal in 1913. And the California Department of Fish and Game biologists were keeping track of the numbers and the reports they were getting from citizens like the Point Sur light station keeper who wrote to the department in 1915 that he had seen up to 32 sea otters. So in all likelihood, the survival of the Southern sea otter was a pure accident of geography. This rugged coastline off Big Sur offered no safe anchorage for the fur hunting vessels. And 
when it opened finally in 1937 to the public with the opening of Highway 1, large numbers of people all of a sudden learned that there were sea otters in California. And it was actually a really big deal. Life magazine did a piece on it entitled The Extinct Sea Otter Swims Back to Life. So since that time, sea otters have spread slowly along the coast. In 1972, they were protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And in 1977, they were listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened. You can see the current range here in red. The yellow range, the, the yellow marking is the historical range. And I, I should note that this is the range of the subspecies somewhere in Oregon it transitioned into animals that were more like northern sea otters, a, a different subspecies. The southern sea otters ranged all the way down to Baja, California. <clears throat> so range expansion has not occurred at the northern periphery of the range, which is marked there by Pigeon Point, for several decades. And it also hasn't expanded for the last two decades at the southern end of the range, which is marked by uh, Gaviota State Beach. You do see a little red spot at San Nicolas Island. That's the result of a translocation effort that occurred in the late 1980s, and there are about 100 sea otters there. But the main question is, why is this range so restricted and why hasn't it expanded further? So to answer that, let's take a deeper dive into the dynamics of the population along the mainland, which is where most southern sea otters live, which is there are about 3,000 sea otters there. And what you can see here is that along the central California coast, you have higher densities. Those are the areas marked in shades of orange. And those sea otters were long thought to be at carrying capacity, but beginning uh, a few years ago, they got a boost in the form of uh, a food subsidy that resulted from sea star wasting disease. And this is a terrible disease that afflicted sea stars causing their arms to fall off and their bodies to turn into goo. And the effect of it was to release the small size classes of sea urchins from predation. And those sea urchins then survived to enter the size classes that sea otters really love to eat. And so sea otters had um, a boom of food abundance for a few years, but that does appear to be tapering off. There are very different dynamics going on at the northern and southern peripheries of the range. And you can see that they're marked in yellow, meaning uh, low, much lower densities, with the exception of Elkhorn Slough Estuary, right there in orange. But the main reason for these low densities at the northern and southern ends of the range is a very high rate of shark bite mortality, which has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. It's always been a factor in the north, but it has become an extremely serious factor in the south. And um, the sh shark bite mortality areas are sort of converging a little bit towards the middle. The, the thought, uh, the hypothesis behind the, the increase of white shark bites is that um, pinniped populations have increased along the coast. The rookeries have established Pinnipeds are one of the main food items or the main food item of white sharks. Um, and so that potentially is what is drawing them and keeping them in new areas or um, and increasing the overlap between sea otters and white sharks during the year. The main problem here though is that we have a population at or near carrying capacity in the center of the range and we have it tightly bound in by these areas of shark bite mortality. So now I'm gonna take you through a graph that shows sea otter numbers in relation to criteria established under the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act, which I'm going to refer to on as ESA and MMPA. We established the current ESA recovery criteria for southern sea otters in 2003 with the publication of the recovery plan. The red bar here is the uplisting threshold. That's the number below which if sea otters fell, we would, we would consider uplisting to, to endangered status. The yellow line is the delisting threshold. 
or if the number exceeds that, we consider delisting. And you can see the blue lines, that's the actual population trajectory over time, has increased over time and is now hovering around the delisting threshold. And in fact, we're currently in the middle of a species status assessment where we're looking at all the factors affecting the species. And that is the basis of a determination of whether we think it's appropriate to delist. Now, regardless of what happens with the Endangered Species Act, sea otters are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And the relevant management criterion in that case is the optimum sustainable population size, which is that line in green. And a, a brand new estimate of that is that the number would be somewhere above 10,000 animals. And the main point here is that there's a really big difference between that MMPA criterion and the ESA criterion criteria below. And finally, this darker green line near the top is the carrying capacity of California. That's um, the number of otters that could be sustained uh, by the habitat in California when the population has reached equilibrium abundance, meaning it's no longer growing anymore and it's not declining. It's sort of hovering around the maximum. While the ESA focuses on preventing extinction, the MMPA requires something entirely different, that we bring a species back to a condition in which it's a significant functioning element of, an eco of the ecosystem of which it's a part. So in other words, we have to restore the ecological relevance of the Southern sea otter. And because they still only occupy a very small portion of their historical range between Oregon and central Baja, California, there are hundreds of miles of coastline that are missing a crucial element of their native ecosystem. You might ask why that matters. All species have important interactions with each other and with their environment, but as many of you know, Sea otters are a keystone species, which means that they have large scale community effects that are disproportionate to their abundance. And they can change an entire ecosystem depending on whether they're present or absent. And this is a result of their lack of blubber. They need to stay warm in a cold ocean and they do that by relying on their perfectly groomed fur coat and an extremely high metabolism, which they need to feed with a lot of food a quarter of their body weight every day. And so by eating a lot of sea urchins, sea otters protect the forest from overgrazing and in doing so they protect all the other species that depend on the kelp forest for food, habitat, shelter, et cetera, including fin fish that are targets of commercial and recreational fisheries. In the Elkhorn Slough estuary, sea otters have also been found to trigger a trophic cascade. This one's even a little bit more complicated. It has a couple of additional levels. Sea otters eat a lot of crabs, freeing up grazers like this sea hare in the right side of your screen from predation. And sea otters are grazers, but they're not grazing the seagrass, they're actually grazing the epiphytic algae that grow on the outside of the seagrass or on the surface of the seagrass. And you can see that brown, nasty looking film on the seagrass. Those are the algal epiphytes. So by cleaning it off, they allow the seagrass to absorb light and to photosynthesize and to survive. In places with heavy runoff from human activities, you get a lot of nitrogen waste that fuels the growth of these epiphytes and they can actually snuff out the seagrass by blocking out too much light. So sea otters are actually working to mitigate the effects of human pollution. And just like kelp, seagrass provides important habitat for numerous other species. And also like kelp, it helps to buffer the shoreline against storms and erosion. So there's a connection here to climate change. By increasing the abundance of seagrass and kelp, sea otters are helping mitigate the effects of human-caused climate change. And that's because both kelp and seagrass remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it, meaning 
tuck it away so it's not contributing to planetary warming and it's also not contributing to ocean acidification. So in the case of seagrass, it sequesters the carbon dioxide by locking it down into the estuarine sediment. And seagrass is extremely effective at sequestering carbon. Kelp also sequesters carbon dioxide because a portion of the kelp detritus is transported to the deep ocean where it can persist for long periods of time. And researchers have quantified these effects variously. Um, there is some, there's quite a large range because there is uncertainty about the magnitude of the total carbon transport to the deep ocean. But one study by Gregor et al., um, a team of Canadians, found that sea otter predation just off of Vancouver Island resulted in carbon storage that could be valued at 2.2 million Canadian dollars per year. That's 1.6 million US dollars on the European carbon market. And a study that covered an even larger area, Wilmers et al. in 2012 found that sea otter predation off of Vancouver Island and the Aleutian Islands, um, the ones in the US, increased carbon storage from a low, here's the low estimate, the low end of the estimate, six to 21 million US dollars per year, up to potentially 294 to 1,060 million US dollars per year. And sea otters don't only help to slow climate change itself, but they've recently been shown to help slow some of the knock-on effects of climate change. And so this study was just published a couple of weeks ago in Science, and it was looking at the effects of sea urchin grazing on the living calcareous reefs that form the anchor points for kelp forests throughout the Aleutian Islands. So this is a, a coralline algae that forms these calcareous reefs. And it's typically safe from sea urchin grazing because it has a hard, um, hard skeletal material um, made of calcium carbonate, but ocean acidification weakens that. And so what they found was that warming sea surface temperatures and increased ocean acidification were both affecting the reefs and allowing the damage done by these grazing sea urchins, which you can see in the picture on the right, to be much, much worse than it would have been under conditions without the warming and without the ocean acidification. And they found that where sea otters were present, they buffered the damage, delaying the negative effects of climate change on the reefs. So as we know in California all too well, especially in wake of the recent fires, Climate change is an existential threat, but what about people's even more immediate economic concerns? You might know that sea otter range expansion has been contentious in almost every instance it has occurred in the recent century because of competition with humans for shellfish. And that occurred because shellfish abundance got to unreasonably, unnaturally high levels in the absence of sea otters um, in the wake of the fur trade. And fisheries developed, and then when sea otters came back, there was a big conflict. So the same researchers who quantified the effect of sea otters on carbon sequestration off Vancouver Island also quantified the effects on other human goods. And they found that although sea otters have indeed a, a negative effect on shellfish fisheries of about 7 million Canadian dollars annually, they have a positive influence on finfish production, uh, finfish catch in the fishery through their influence on kelp, about um, a benefit of $9 million annually. The benefit due to carbon sequestration, as we already saw, was about 2 million. And the benefit to ecotourism was about 42 million. So in total, they found that the benefits outweighed the costs about sevenfold. So I'm going to close this talk by asking, what kind of future do we want to see in California? 
This is a picture taken by Ryan Bartling of California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and some of you will recognize the Bay Bridge. We sometimes get these long distance travelers. They're usually males. They're exploring unoccupied areas of the range, and it doesn't usually indicate anything important about range expansion, but it's still an exciting sight. Uh, you see a lot of industry in the background, and it's undeniable that we've radically transformed most of the important historical habitats of sea otters throughout California. But it's also true that there are many restoration efforts currently underway. And my final question for you is, could sea otters be our partners in this restoration? Thanks for listening. You're on, Andy. Hi there. Am I on? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, hi there, I'm Andy Johnson with Defenders of Wildlife, and I'm gonna talk a bit, hopefully extending on from what Lillian talked about, um, and talk about some of the options and opportunities for restoring sea otters to historical habitat, like the San Francisco Bay or, or northward. Um, Lillian just presented this information uh, from uh, Gregor and colleagues uh, in Canada, uh, modeling the uh, value of sea otters. So sea otters without question have, have value. They have intrinsic value, they have ecological value, as Lillian discussed, and they have economic value, um, you know, up to sevenfold over, uh, over perhaps the shell fishing industry alone, uh, the value of the shell fishing industry. And um, this, uh, this paper also talked about the, uh, uh, the recovery of keystone predators, um, not only restores the ecosystems, but can affect a range of social, economic, and ecological benefits. So um, sea otters have, have measurable value, I guess is the take home there. Um, looking at this range map, um, Lillian kind of talked about the historical range, the areas in gold are the kind of the current uh, occupied areas of the range. So sea otters have made a comeback in a lot of areas, um, but there's this big gap, uh, as William discussed, um, extending from the southern part of the California range, uh, past Point, Point Conception in the south, um, up through Oregon and into Washington. Um, so whether or not um, the southern subspecies was uh, part of that historically or not um, remains to be talked about, but, um, but there's this big area, this big gap of, I think it's about 1400 miles where sea otters are still absent, where they can't get back to. And that's, uh, I think, an area for uh, of opportunity. Um, and as Lillian discussed, uh, we have, I don't know, I call it the California situation, but where range expansion really hasn't occurred for, for 20 years or more, particularly in the north. Um, and further expansion beyond that range um, extent uh, really seems constrained by, by shark bites. So uh, unless something big changes in the e ecology of, uh, sea otters and white sharks, um, it's, it seems starting to seem unlikely like sea otters will keep expanding northward into that huge, huge gap area. Um, I think if we uh, look to actively address this, you know, the gap as I <laughs> talked about it, um, we need to look beyond their, uh, their protection now, which involves uh, mitigating threats and disturbance and uh, advancing this idea of coexistence and really looking at uh, uh, addressing their conservation for the future which beyond just advancing coexistence, um, almost certainly involves uh, this active support for range expansion. How, how can we actually do that? Um, and uh, I'll talk in more detail about that. Uh, but first, I'll give a quick plug for Seattle Savvy, who's uh, uh, helped sponsor this, this event tonight. Um, but they, they've come into existence by looking to address those, those initial areas of mitigating, mitigating disturbance and advancing coexistence, um, striving to foster responsible behavior, by users of the marine, marine environment while they are viewing and recreating their sea otters. And that extends to basically all wildlife. Um, but with sea otters, uh, there are these disturbance hotspots, are particular areas where humans and sea otters um, really do overlap. So this need for figuring out how to not disturb them, let them live their lives and coexist with them is, is key. And I'll give another plug for uh, the sixth annual coastal Cal California Coastal Wildlife Disturbance Symposium in mid-November. Uh, might want to check that out. Um, Seattle Savvy and California State Parks 
host that. So that's become a pretty cool statewide event. Um, so really the, the options for trying to get otters into places where they were historically and maybe should be again, uh, Lillian talked about this idea of translocation, uh, but sort of the, the umbrella term that, that I think applies is, is reintroduction, which is uh, very, very basically um, uh, the IUCN defines it as uh, the movement or release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it has disappeared uh, to establish a viable population. So, um, so pretty straightforward. Translocation is a little more specific. Uh, so you're basically taking uh, animals from one site within uh, an occupied range and moving it to an area that's unoccupied, uh, but historically was occupied by that species. Um, and there has to be benefit to doing that. You can't just uh, say benefit the, the, the animals that you move. It has to benefit that, that ecosystem as a whole. So I think as, uh, as we've heard, um, this idea that sea otters are definitely going to benefit these areas when they move there. We've seen it uh, uh, throughout their range. So um, looking at these reintroduction trajectories, uh, really all have been translocations uh, to Southeast Alaska, to British Columbia, to Washington State, uh, to Oregon, and as Lillian described, San Nicolas Island in California. Um, largely those, those uh, tra translocations have been successful. Um, only one trans translocation to Oregon, um, and I believe one in the Pribilof Islands a long time ago, uh, failed to take. Um, but uh, if you can sort of see those, that typical trajectory of um, you put a bunch of animals into the new location, um, they maybe struggle for a little bit, but then they kind of take off and, and start doing what sea otters do. They reproduce, they expand into uh, uh, larger and larger territory and, um, and are successful because that's where they succeeded before. Um, in Oregon, it didn't take. Uh, at San Nicolas Island, uh, a lot of animals were moved. Um, a lot of animals probably swam back to the mainland or, or expired. And, uh, but eventually they kind of caught on and now, they're, now the population is growing. Um, and the last example in Elkhorn Slough um, is uh, something I'll talk about in more detail, but that, that I look at as a true reintroduction and I'll explain why. So, um, but uh, to start it off, first you have to get a sea otter. So whether you um, are finding a, a population from which to draw animals for a translocation or whether you're, you're uh, uh, doing some, some other means, you have to get a sea otter. So I'll just uh, show this quick video. Um, one day at the Monterey Bay Aquarium about five years ago uh, in their great tide pool outside in a gentle rain, this female came up on the rocks and, um, and did this thing, which is about as cool a thing as can be. So we know that the translocations offer a solid opportunity to restore I'll let that end there. Uh, oops. There we go. <laughs> Who wants to see that again? Um, so we know that uh, uh, the translocation works, but this, this new idea that uh, was pioneered at the Monterey Bay Aquarium was this idea of sea otter surrogacy. So how can you take um, uh, animals that were coming in live stranded from the beach uh, and rear them and put them back out there again? And the aquarium struggled with this idea for years. Uh, a long time, they used human caregivers to try to um, raise the pups. And when they released them, they would go out there. And some of them succeeded, but a lot of them uh, didn't succeed. Um, it's fairly high mortality rate, or the animals had to be brought back in because they were uh, jumping on people and um, uh, they just weren't succeeding on their own in the wild. So um, eventually, the aquarium tried this uh, the surrogacy program, which was, well, let's see if a female sea otter who isn't releasable, um, who lives at the aquarium, could uh, actually raise one of these stranded pups. And, um, and it's, it's, it worked out actually, that's the over, only proven method for rearing stranded pups and being able to release, release them successfully back to the wild. Um, this program has expansion, expansion capability. Um, we've talked about uh, uh, expanding the program to other areas with a lot of sea otter expertise like SeaWorld, uh, Aquarium of the Pacific and Long Beach. And the question is, is this a viable alternative to translocation? And I would argue that it is. Um, just a quick trajectory of the surrogacy program uh, includes rearing a stranded sea otter pup by, by disguised caregivers. We don't want them to see us and, and bond to us uh, until it's eight weeks of, old, eight weeks of age. Um, if it's a day old when it comes in, it'll spend about eight weeks in the ICU. If it's six or seven weeks, it'll only spend a couple weeks in the ICU. So 
Um, we have to get it to a certain point where it can be weaned on the solid food for the most part. And then the pup is, uh, um, for lack of a better term, tossed in with a, uh, one of these females from uh, the aquarium's uh, sea otter exhibit um, that we can't release. Uh, she'll be separated into a kind of a private pool and the pup will be uh, lobbed in there. And um, uh, so introducing the pup to the female, uh, the female will teach it uh, social skills, survival skills over the course of, of four months or so until um, it reaches sort of a natural weaning age and then the two will be separated. Um, uh, the pup will then be allowed to grow up a bit longer um, after weaning uh, from the surrogate, but um, eventually it will be released. Um, you know, maybe the eight to nine months, not eight to nine month range is sort of the, uh, the low end, but, um, but usually before a year of age. And uh, so it's a nice, nice healthy yearling um, ready to try and survive. And uh, releasing these animals into Elkhorn Slough, that was the target site that was selected. So here was uh, an, an estuary where there were some sea otters and where uh, uh, there was uh, protection, there was food. Um, it was deemed a, a good site to try this, uh, basically an experiment. And, um, and as it turned out, these uh, surrogate reared otters uh, had pups. They survived, uh, they, they did well. If any of you heard the story of Otter 501, um, she came to the aquarium as a very, very young pup, a very small pup, um, was reared through the surrogacy program and released in Delcorn Slough. And she's gone on to have a number of pups on her own. So uh, um, kind of a cool thing. Uh, eventually a publication came out uh, that uh, in essence shows that surrogacy works. Um, the surrogate root, surrogate root pups succeeded on release in Delcorn Slough and remained there. Uh, they reproduced and spurred growth of the sea otter population within the slough. Um, it used to be sort of a, an all male area. Um, and then it transitioned uh, through, mainly through the aquarium's release of otters there uh, into a, a more natural uh, uh, breeding site for, uh, for sea otters. Um, they spurred the population growth there. Uh, survivorship, reproductive success, and longevity mirrored that of wild reared sea otters. So um, there wasn't some strange, uh, you know, only a few animals made it. Um, really, the anim animals survived and did well, quite well there. And then the top down effects, uh, as, as Lillian described, of more sea otters uh, in Elkhorn Slough helped restore the eelgrass, uh, the seagrass in the slough. So uh, ecosystem uh, benefits of, of uh, seeing the increase in return of sea otters to that area. So when it comes to sea otter reintroduction options, um, well, there's sort of the, the no option, which is natural range expansion. Um, it doesn't require any animals from the source population directly. Animals will just move into the new areas naturally. Uh, it takes a long time though. And as we've seen in California, it may take too long. Um, these animals aren't moving into new areas. Um, there are no transport logistics and costs like there are with translocations. Um, and there's natural adoption of the habitat and ranges. Uh, there's no post-release monitoring. They just do it naturally. Um, there's natural mortality, of course. But uh, as you've seen, we've seen in these other areas where otters are translocated, um, there's moderate success uh, depending on the location. These animals move into new, their new areas and, uh, and do quite well and expand their areas, but not in California. Um, reintroduction via translocation has a couple of key, key challenges or, or problems, um, one of which is it requires high numbers from a source population. So in the issue of San Nicolas Island, uh, I think 140 animals ended up being pulled from the mainland population to move to San Nicolas Island over a couple of years. Um, and that happened within a short time frame. Um, there were high transport logistics and costs, uh, high post-release dispersal. So a lot of these animals swam back to the mainland and, um, and there was high mortality almost certainly. Uh, it takes a lot of energy for sea otters to swim long distances. Uh, they can do it. Um, I remember one animal turned up down in, in San Diego Bay and in, in, in Mission Bay uh, from San Nicolas Island, but, um, but by and large, uh, the animals didn't stay at San Nicolas Island. Um, but as we've seen, uh, moderate success with a lot of translocations. And now this idea of reintroduction via surrogacy um, requires low numbers or basically no numbers from the source population. Uh, these little pups are essentially dead to the population. They are absolutely gonna die if there isn't human intervention when they come ashore. Um, their mother has either abandoned them or the mother has died and, um, uh, or they've been separated. Uh, the anim these pups aren't, aren't going to survive. So, um, uh, but it takes a long time. So it takes uh, continually uh, putting these animals out, uh, adding to the groups you put in before, uh, you know, 10 year, 10 plus years um, uh, to get these animals to kind of stick and, and see the uh, ecological benefits, to see the, the population increases. Um, there's moderate transport logistics and costs, just like with uh, translocation. 
Uh, but we did see low post-release dispersal um, when we released them in, in Elkhorn Slough. Uh, and it does take high post-release monitoring. You have to track these animals closely to make sure that they survive. You can't just kind of throw them out there and hope, hope for the best. Um, but there was relatively low mortality, or I would say sort of natural levels of mortality and moderate to high success. So I think that's uh, you know, in the running as, a, as an option. Um, uh, the talk tomorrow night uh, from Dr. Ben Hughes, is, uh, he'll talk about this idea of um, species recolonizing past habitats and really uh, looking at estuaries as, as targets for, uh, uh, for how sea otters might, might move, uh, move northward to California, whether that's naturally or, uh, or with assistance. So historically, sea otters were ubiquitous in uh, inhabitants of estuaries. Um, as Lillian said, thousands probably lived in, uh, must have lived in um, San Francisco Bay if they were pulling out 2,000 animals a year. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Elkhorn Slough study uh, documented that release, of, release success in ecosystem restoration um, from releasing into an estuary. Um, the Hughes paper encourages consideration of estuary sites as release targets. And, uh, but there are issues between estuary versus open ocean releases. And I'll talk about those a bit. Um, the challenges with the estuary releases is that it's, you know, proximity to people. Um, in Elkhorn Slough, as is a thriving kayak industry, um, a lot of people paddling close to sea otters. Um, it's something that has to be attended to. That's one of the hot spots for sea otter savvy that uh, where they've tried to address uh, uh, human uh, and sea otter disturbance uh, fairly successfully. Um, there's potential conflicts with fisheries, depending on, on where the release happens. Um, and, uh, and even if translocated otters or otters are translocated to an estuary, you're probably so likely to have dispersal. They aren't going to stick around. They're going to head out in the, into the sea. The challenge with open ocean releases is that the animals are exposed to rougher conditions. There's probably going to be lower survival. Um, with high dispersal, they'll be harder to track, um, hard to track and follow and, and maybe intervene if, if necessary. Um, and probably high mortality as well, or higher mortality than estuary releases. And then the, uh, there's this translocation site fidelity issue, um, which is a uh, high dispersal mortality associated with past translocations uh, really isn't, I don't think, an option now. Um, so uh, in San, San Nicolas Island, where a lot of animals moved and a lot of animals left, um, either uh, they died or just returned to the mainland, and certainly in other translocations um, in Southeast Alaska, Washington, and so forth, a lot of the animals you move aren't going to make it. And um, I think it, it, it's be a bit of a hard sell these days to uh, say, yeah, we're going to move 200, 200 animals from here, put them there, and, um, and, uh, but 150, 150 of them are going to die. Um, that's going to be a, a tough sell. So, um, but this idea of San Francisco Bay, uh, this huge estuary, um, or a smaller estuary like Drake's Estero tucked in um, uh, to Point Reyes, uh, Tomales Bay, which sort of threatens to cut Point Reyes off from the, uh, from the mainland there. Um, and estuaries farther up the coast, even into Oregon, um, that there's uh, opportunities to explore that. Um, San Francisco is far different than it was before the fur trade. Um, it's been uh, highly degraded, and even with current restoration efforts, it's still a, still a problem in terms of releasing animals there. Are they going to um, are they going to be essentially poisoned by, by uh, uh, pollutants that are in the bay? Um, uh, there's a lot of boat traffic. There's uh, all sorts of uh, potential conflicts. But sea otters could potentially help restore the bay. So it's uh, uh, intriguing to think about. Um, so really the challenges for a reintroduction, um, looking at the source population for reintroduction, uh, northern sea otters from southeast Alaska, uh, where the population is booming, um, that could be a source population, but again, you might have to grab a lot of animals, move them a long distance. They might not stay there. Um, or looking at surrogate reared southern sea otters um, through the aquarium pioneered by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, looking at reintroduction release sites, you have sort of the estuary versus open ocean release uh, options. Um, I think there's a good argument that estuary sites are, uh, uh, might have uh, might tip the scales in that direction. Uh, huge funding cost, no matter what. Um, it's uh, it's expensive op uh, operation, but um, but there are a lot of efficiencies that can be built in, uh, particularly with the uh, I think with the surrogacy and uh, release uh, effort. Um, tons of legal issues and permits. Uh, that's all Lillian's to deal with, um, and the changing marine environment. Uh, the the climate, the the ocean conditions aren't going to be the same five years from now, ten years from now, as uh, maybe a program gets going. So. Those are all considerations. 
and uh, and challenges. And then really uh, key in, is engagement with stakeholders. So uh, sea otters were released into areas without considering um, local groups, uh, tribal groups, um, and uh, and those sea otters had huge impacts on local economies and and other things. So um, a number of, of groups are, are now looking at the impact of sea otters and uh, how that um, how that plays off against the issues uh, with other stakeholders, whether it's uh, you know, fisheries and so forth. So um, uh, key issues for a reintroduction discussion uh, to maybe help fill that 1400 mile gap. And then um, if we're looking for a reintroduction model planning, we don't have to look too far. A uh, group in Oregon, the Alaka Alliance, um, over the past couple of years has really um, uh, you know, set the stage for a possible return of otters to Oregon. Uh, they've got a, a strategic plan. They've held uh, symposia. Um, they're uh, contracted for do a feasibility study, like site feasibility. Is there enough food to support otters? Um, you know, with pr proper habitat and so forth. Um, they've connected with people and organizations uh, in the coming year. They're really looking to complete an economic in impact assessment. Um, so look at uh, uh, fisheries in the region and other other uh, impacts that, that could affect economies. Um, and really develop a, a whole research plan to support the reintroduction decision so that maybe in three, four, five years, they can come to sort of a decision point and say, yes, we should move forward with a reintroduction or, or no, that's really kind of a bad idea and we'll just maybe let things happen naturally. But that, that's a sort of um, strategic long-term thinking that really is needed to make something like this happen. Um, so um, I'll make one final plug. Uh, the uh, Defenders of Wildlife and Sea Otter Savvy um, developed this uh, nice little story map that um, that uh, basically tours special places along the California coast that plays a part uh, in the past, present, and future uh, recovery of California sea otters. Um, it's kind of a nice way to get some information uh, about uh, where you can see sea otters along the coast, um, some issues, uh, some historical information about sea otters along the coast, um, where you can watch them now, where are the hot spots for uh, possible disturbance, where you need to be especially careful. So, um, so check that out. Uh, maybe we can put these links in the in the chat chat area. And um, I know we're going to head back to Mo, but I'll stop there, and uh, we'll catch questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> so, all the researchers that are working on trying to reintroduce the sea otters or planning for helping sea otters expand. Can you use scientific research collections like the one here at the California Academy of Sciences to inform some of their management decisions? So studying sea otter specimens in a museum can tell them things about how the animals died, uh, what they ate, some of their morphologies like measuring their skulls, but we can also use uh, specimens for genetic information too. So if a situation came up where we're, people are looking to reintroduce a sea otter from a different place, they might want to check the genetic strain. And you can use tissue, you can even use bone from specimens here in the collection at the academy to study that, that question and answer that question. So let's take a little journey down to the specimens. Um, the, the collection is kind of like a library, and I'm the librarian, but instead of taking care of books, I take care of uh, scientific research specimens. And researchers can come from all over the world to work in the collection to study all the different animals and ask the questions that they might have. Um, like I said earlier, we have over 1,500 catalog southern sea otter specimens in the collection. And they are housed down here in this row. Everything is organized <clears throat> taxonomically, which means uh, the way they are in nature, who they're most closely related to. So sea otters are down the aisle with some of the other pinnipeds. Not that they're pinnipeds, but they're with some pinnipeds. So here we are in the collection row where the sea otters are located. We have uh, dogs over here and wolves. And then we have walruses. So here's a young walrus specimen. Um, you can see the tusk. This one came from Alaska. 
And then next to those, uh, we move into the pinnipeds, some of the, the foces. So the northern elephant seals are here, and then the harbor seals are here. And then we have our southern sea otter collection. So earlier I showed you uh, the articulated skeleton of the southern sea otter that was behind me on the shelf. Well, most of our specimens are not articulated because uh, we're mostly for research behind the scenes here. So this is an entire sea otter skeleton in a box. So that's every bone from the skeleton. And it's used uh, by researchers for various studies. So one example is uh, the Transbay Terminal when they were digging it here in San Francisco. They found some bones that they thought might be sea otter bones. So they say they found a scapula. This is a sea otter scapula. If an archeologist found a scapula that they thought was a sea otter, they wanna make sure that it's a sea otter. So they would come to the collection with their specimen and they would pull out scapula from different species to compare them. Now each bone has to be numbered with the catalog number. That way things don't get mixed up and they all get back into the the correct box. Uh, so that was one study that happened in the collection. This otter, let me put down the box for a second. This one actually is a shark bite cave. It's not going to work very well. So you can you can see right where at the tip of my finger with my mask in the background right there, that is actually a shark tooth that's embedded in the skull of this southern sea otter. So this is a male, it's probably a young one, it's not very big. You can see its teeth. Uh, we can actually age them by their teeth. Um, this tiny little uh, premolar is pulled out and given to uh, California Department of Fishing and Wildlife so that they can actually cut it in half and they can read the layers or count the layers of bone in their, of, um, not bone, dentin and uh, enamel that are in there. And that tells them how old the sea otter is. Um, but this one, you can see the, the cranium and the lower mandible come right apart as they should. So that is one of our shark bite. And Lillian talked about shark bites and the effects that they have on sea otters and uh, the population. And one of the concerns is, is that the sharks don't actually eat the sea otters necessarily. They'll take a bite and then they'll kind of spit it out. And so sea otters have a million hairs per square inch. They have no fat layer to keep them warm, unlike the pinnipeds like the northern elephant seals. And both northern elephant seals and southern sea otters went to the bottleneck in the early 1900s. Sea otters, of course, like you learned earlier, because of the fur trade for their fur, elephant seals were also heavily hunted for their fat. And so a large elephant seal would give a lot of muscle and blubber to the hunters at the time. And in fact, the elephant seal population has really rebounded since. So this is a northern elephant seal. This is a subadult male. Um, you can see those are called the nasal turbinates inside. Everybody always asks me about those. We have those in our nose too. It helps to clean our breath as it goes in and out with the membrane and the hairs that are on top of them. But the northern elephant seals have a very different breeding strategy than southern sea otters. Lillian mentioned rookeries. So northern elephant seals, a male will have a group of females on his rookery that he breeds with. So they can reproduce many, many, many young. And the maternal care for a young elephant seal is about three months. The mother nurses it for three months. It gets really fat, turns into what we call a wiener. And they're weaned. So she stops nursing them and then they're left on their own to go out into the ocean. So the time that the adults have to invest in their young is very short. Whereas for southern sea otters, a mother can nurse 
a pup for six to nine months. So she spends a long time nursing that pup. And she also spends a long time teaching that pup how to feed. Elephant seal wieners have to just go out and learn how to feed on their own. But Southern sea otters will actually teach their pups how to feed. And they have um, lots of choices when it comes to food. Sea otters have to eat between 20 and 30% of their body weight each day because their metabolism is so high. And they typically have several items that they really specialize in, like their favorite foods. And if a southern sea otter specializes in sea urchins, you know that they're helping the kelp forest by eating the sea urchins. But the sea urchins can also have an effect on the southern sea otters when they're eating them. And what happens sometimes, not always, but if a southern sea otter pup learns from its mother to, to specialize in sea urchins, their skull and sometimes their teeth and sometimes even the rest of their skeleton turns a slight tinge of purple. Can you guys see this skull here? You can see right at the base of the teeth, maybe it's easier to see, is purple. And this one here is very, very white. If that's not clear enough, maybe Christina can put up some photos that we have. Um, but look at those teeth and the difference in the color of the teeth with uh, the white one. So there's a purple sea otter skull picture that was taken by the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. That one was necropsy, so that's why the skull is cut in the back there. So this purple sea otter skull, remember that skeleton, I was able to pull the mandible sep separate from the skull. This one actually has osteoarthritis of the temporal mandibular joint here. So I cannot separate the uh, mandible. And there were researchers from UC Davis Veterinary College who came here to the collection. They looked at over a thousand of our sea otter specimens and they were able to look at dental pathologies in sea otters. And they found that about 74% of the sea otters in our collection showed some form of dental pathology. In most cases, it was periodontitis or gum disease. And that represented itself as teeth that had fallen out or a receding uh, bone around the tooth. But then they also found that 4% of the otters had this osteoarthritis of the temporal mandibular joints. And that was something that they didn't know about sea otters until uh, that, that study was done. So in the past uh, 15 years, may, actually the past 10 years, about 15 publications have come out. Oh, the lights just turned off, how creepy. <laughs> Automatically at eight o'clock, well, I am. Um, I cannot actually get to the lights and turn them back on. So you get to stay in the collection with me in the dark. I have one more specimen Not that to show creepy. you. <laughs> yeah, it is creepy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's creepy when you're me by myself in here, even <laughs> though I know you're all out there. So this is a sea otter pelt. Uh, we do uh, not always, but we will keep the pelt. So you can see that million hairs per square inch, why someone might have wanted to add uh, an article of warmth back in the the days before Gore-Tex. If you look at the back of this sea otter, you can't even really see that there's anything going on back here. But when you turn the pelt inside out, I hope it's not too blurry. There you go. You can see those are shark bites. That's a, the remnants of a shark bite. So the shark actually bit the sea otter did not consume it, which is pretty typical. And then the skin was damaged, thus causing enough injury to the sea otter that they can't recover from that. Um, the last study I heard was that 50% of the southern sea otters that are found dead um, in the last few years along our coast have been shark bite victims. They also have issues with, I saw in the chat, someone asked about Toxoplasma gondii, and that is an issue uh, with flushing cat litter down the drain. The parasite can get into the water system, and that can be bad for southern sea otters. And there are other diseases that are caused by agricultural runoff that causes um, 
excess growth of algae and, and uh, bacteria in the water that can harm sea otters. So I know we're at the Q&A. I might sneak around and turn the lights back on while we start that up. Is that okay, Christina? Yeah, well, why don't you run and I can still on. talk, but I don't have to be creeped out. <laughs> um, thanks, Mo. Uh, always love hearing stories from the collection. Um, great. We'll have a couple minutes for Q&A with Lillian, Andy, and Mo. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, Lillian, let's start with a question for you. Um, how many different types of otters are there in California, and what's the difference between a sea and river otter? Um, well, so there are two types of otters, river otters and sea otters. And river otters use fresh water, and they do sometimes come into the ocean, but they also use fresh water. Um, they have litters of pups. They have multiple pups at a time, whereas sea otters have only one pup at a time. Uh, river otters eat fish, whereas sea otters eat shellfish, so benthic invertebrates. Um, the rear, the, the hind limbs of a sea otter are flipper-like, and um, the hind limbs of a river otter are paws with claws. Uh, river otters are, I think, better at walking on land than sea otters are. Um, sea otters are a little more awkward with their big flippers. Um, so those are some of the differences. I'm sure there are more. Great. Andy, um, can the Montemarie Bay Aquarium or other organizations help expand the area where sea otters are protected? Um, expand the areas where sea otters are protected? Um, Probably not specifically. Um, that's up to the Fish and Wildlife Service. But uh, um, but in terms of uh, helping to expand uh, the the range of sea otters, uh, that's sort of the um, the the point we are uh, pushing a little bit is that um, you know just kind of letting things go uh, hasn't really succeeded in in, uh, in encouraging otters to to move into areas where they were historically. Um, so now we're kind of looking at this idea of can we, uh, either through translocation or release of surrogate reared animals, um, ex expand that range, get those otters back where they where they were and, and probably where they should be, where we know that they'll have positive ecosystem effects. So, um, uh, so Monterey Bay Aquarium alone can't do it, as, uh, as we've talked about in a lot of these, uh, um, in a lot of our slides, um, the idea of, of how we uh, have to collaborate um, state and federal agencies, academic institutions, uh, tribal groups, um, academia, ancient academia, um, but uh, a lot of people have to be involved in these decisions, um, and uh, it's it's uh, a, a big undertaking. So uh, I think it's going to take um, certainly the Monterey Bay Aquarium, but uh, the Leighton's organization, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and everybody to really pull together if something like this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, follow up question because you just mentioned tribal groups. One of our viewers asked. Has anyone reached out to Bay Area Indigenous people to find out if the tribe support or would be willing to foster reintroduction? Um, I, I don't know offhand. I think I think things haven't progressed that far here. I know up in Oregon, the Alaka Alliance um, uh, has, has has done that. Um, uh, Alaka is the the, the Silets Indian word for sea otter, and um, so it, they, a big part of their initial outreach was. Uh, was making sure that the tribal groups in that region um, would be involved in in the decision making in the uh, in the meetings about that. Um, obviously, if uh, things progressed to um, uh, looking at releases or reintroductions of otters um, up the coast, uh, that would absolutely have to involve um, all the stakeholders. Uh, something like San Francisco yeah. Bay is sort of monumental because they're you know think of all the the cities and incorporated areas around around the bay that would have to be involved, all the uh, conservation groups that are involved in restoration projects, um, as well as uh, uh, indigenous groups and other interest groups. Um, it's, uh, it's mind boggling. <laughs> um, one for Mo, I've been in the specimen room before, but I wasn't able to see the sea otters. Is there any way a citizen scientist can see the specimen? 
So most of the time, the specimens are not available to folks unless they have a research question. Uh, we do have artists and scientists that come into the collection. We do sometimes offer tours of the collection, but that's mostly for academic groups. Um, and uh, at nightlife, I think we've done at least two or three during nightlife and during special member events. But mm -hmm. primarily, primarily the collections are for researchers that have specific research questions to ask. Great. Um, this is for anyone who wants to answer. What is the best way for a citizen scientist to become involved in the conservation of sea otters? I'll jump in and, and <laughs> say that Sea Otter Savvy would be a great place to start. Uh, they're a research-based group that also does advocacy and messaging, so you could get in on um, any level. And uh, the leader of Sea Otter Savvy, Jenna Bental, is a trained sea otter biologist who formerly worked for U.S. Geological Survey, and so the data they collect is compatible with um, with the other data that have been collected in scientific sea otter studies. So, um, if you're if you want to get involved in science, that's a great way to do it. If you want to get involved in advocacy, that's a great way to do it. If you want to uh, help reduce disturbance, that's a great way to do it. So there's that, and then there are also um, Monterey Bay Aquarium accepts volunteers sometimes. Um, the Marine Mammal Center accepts volunteers sometimes. You could potentially be involved in stranding response after adequate training and commitment. So uh, there are some great ways to get involved. And you can also, if you're on the beaches, walking around doing surveys or um, putting sightings up on iNaturalist is a great way to be involved. And then also if you see an injured or uh, dead stranded sea otter to contact the correct people so that we can learn more from the dead ones and then also get the injured ones into rehab. Great. Um, Lillian, you mentioned that shark bites are a threat to sea otters. Do you see harm by boats or the fishing industry? And then kind of along the same line, someone also mentioned um, kayaking may disturb them too. So they wanted to know what is the most appropriate way to view them? Um, okay, so there are a few questions there. Boat strikes yeah. are a low but persistent source of mortality. So sea otters do get hit by boats. That usually happens in crowded harbors, um, whereas sea otters might be in the channel foraging. For instance, um, moss landing, it's happened many a time where people are eagerly rushing out for the opening of salmon season or some other um, event and they think that sea otters can get out of the way but they, they really can't get out of the way um, fast enough sometimes. And there are times when a sea otter is coming up from a foraging dive and if the boat hits them right then, I mean, they really have no chance. So yes, boat strikes happen but they're not um, a major source of mortality relative to other sources. Shark bites are by far the most significant source of mortality. Um, once in a while, and I think perhaps increasingly, we're seeing recreational fishing gear entanglements of sea otters. And this happens when people cut the line and then the line is out there um, on the ocean floor and the sea otters get entangled in it and that can result in really horrific injuries. And again, it doesn't happen that often relative to some of the major sources of mortality, but it is preventable. Um, you know, collect your line, do not leave line around. And um, if you're a diver, uh, it's a beautiful thing to participate in um, cleanups of the ocean floor. It's a beautiful way to give back um, using your special skill that you have to do that, that not everyone can do. Um, finally, about disturbance. Um, again, I, I would suggest that you go to the Sea Otter Savvy website to look for tips mm -hmm. to avoid disturbance. But one of the main things, if you're kayaking, is to say at the very least five kayak lengths away, sometimes further um, in areas where sea otters are ac um, extra sp spooked because they don't see people that often, to approach in parallel, to never surround sea otters, and to just make sure you put the phone down um, and don't take <laughs> pictures and selfies and actually try to absorb the situation and pay attention to the behavior of the otter that you're looking at. Um, and our general rule is, that if an otter is looking at you, 
then you're too close. That doesn't mean that you've um, mortally harmed that otter yet, but when the otter is looking at you, they're tense, they're nervous, and a reaction could happen right after that. And so you should back away at that point. Okay, now. Um, Mo, this one was for you when you were showing the pelt, but um, I think Lillian or Andy, you could answer too. Why don't sharks eat the sea otters that they bite? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of like when they bite uh, humans by accident. So the shark is down below and they see a surfboard with a human laying on top of it. They don't know that that's not an elephant seal. And they take a bite and then they realize this is not what I want because humans don't have fat that they want. And sea otters also don't have any fat. They just have all those hairs. Um, so they don't, in, they don't eat it, eat them. And then I think we have time for maybe one last question for Andy. Uh, for the groups you mentioned for translocation, were they translocated in small or large, small, large, I guess in groups or individually? And if they varied, did that affect the success rate of reintroduction? Um, well, Lillian can certain, certainly chime in, uh, but generally these have been uh, fairly large uh, movements of animals, um, uh, trying to get uh, a fairly large number of animals uh, move them in a lot of cases they were they would try to sort of stage them in in net pens uh, to get them a bit acclimated to an area um, that has had some benefits but in some cases uh, you know almost no benefit at all um, some otters were just kind of dropped out into the new area some were uh, um, you know again staged in in protected areas for a little while and offered food um, but I think in in general the the initial take home is that uh, take of sea otters to be translocated to get a population that a small population that will stick and then after that the sea otters can uh, take off if the conditions are right. Um, Lillian you may have uh, other comment on that. No I think you make a great point. The, Actually, the major, I'll just say one thing real fast. Um, so sea otters are a, they're a social species they like to be with each other and so bringing sea otters to a place where there are no sea otters at all uh, seems to be problematic for them. And so the, a major challenge is to get over that. A, a, a major problem encountered during translocation was the homing instinct of sea otters. They, they know where their home is and they wanna be there and um, where you've taken them is not their home. And so they tend to want to leave for that reason as well. So those are two major hurdles to overcome um, when you're looking at um, the possibility of a translocation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a slightly different issue when you have otters that you're reintroducing that have been brought up in captivity by a surrogate. They presumably don't have that same site fidelity to a home because they haven't really had a home in the ocean. So um, it's, there's a strong potential that that could be a lot better. Um, but we have, we have to see. Um, we actually had one more question that came through for Mo. My four-year-old daughter would like to know why sea otters like to eat sea urchins when urchins have spikes. <laughs> well, they don't eat the spikes of the sea urchins. They eat the nice soft parts inside the sea urchins. So um, they'll tear off the spikes and they'll use their teeth to open the belly of the sea urchin and then they'll eat the soft parts in there. Um, and this is a great opportunity, everyone. This is Sea Otter Awareness Week. You guys have all come here to learn more about sea otters. And you sh I encourage you all to go online and like everyone has said, go to Sea Otter Savvy and learn more about Southern Sea Otters because there's so much information out there and cool videos that you can watch. Yes. Um, I want to do, just do a special thanks to Mo, Lily, and Andy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to bring on Christina now, um, and we'll close out the night. Christina, you are muted. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, next week, we have Sharktoberfest. It's it's our annual salute to brews and sharks, uh, and it's finally going virtual. So next week, you can learn more about what sharks can teach you about life. We'll also talk about lesser known shark species and also the tech behind tagging and tracking sharks. 
We've also teamed up with Fort Point to do a virtual beer tasting. It'll be quite the experiment, but we're excited. Uh, so make sure to stock up if you want to play along. And we have details on which beers we'll be tasting that um, on our website. And again, thank you so much for your support during this time. Thanks for joining Night School. Um, I think it might be many of your um, first times here, just based on um, who we saw in the audience. But thanks for watching. Um, if you're able to, the Academy has been closed for over six months now. Um, please consider a donation to the Academy's Relief Fund. Any amount truly does help. And the donation is in our YouTube link description. And if not, we would just love to see you again during our programs. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications about all our live stream programs. Um, again, we've been doing this for six months now and seeing you all here through our computer screens uh, makes it all worthwhile. So thank you very much. Yes, thanks. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good night, everyone.